aggregate supply in the long run. How does the supply of goods and services and the prices as well change as factor markets, as the markets for factors of production adjust in the long run? GDP is produced by factors of production, by labor and capital. Let us take a look at what happens in the markets for those factors as the economy tries to produce more or less GDP, more or less output. We're going to focus on the labor market. The labor force, or what we will call the statistical labor force, is made up of two sets of, of, of individuals. There are those that make up what we call the naturally unemployed. The naturally unemployed has two components. There is always a part of your labor force that is frictionally unemployed, that are employable and that usually have jobs, but because an economy is dynamic and businesses are closing while others are expanding and some industries are contracting while others are expanding and people are you know, shifting, moving between cities and wanting to change careers, you're always going to have some small amount of unemployment just because it takes time for people to find new jobs and for jobs to find new people. So there was always some tiny component of the labor force that ends up being between jobs. That is part of the natural unemployment. And then you have those who we call structurally unemployed because they don't have the skills and attitudes that even though they would like to have jobs, they don't have the skills and attitudes that uh, make them employable. So the effective labor force is going to be less than the statistical labor force. It's going to be less than the labor force that is counted by when the country's statistical agency goes around and tries to measure the size of the labor force or you know, everybody who would like to have a job. But the effective labor force is what makes up the economy's productive capacity. Indeed, when the effective labor force is fully employed, we are at what we can reasonably call full employment. Now, it is possible to have less than full employment in the sense that the demand for labor can be less than even the effective labor force. Under those circumstances, when the demand for labor is simply insufficient to employ all of those, not only who would like to have a job, but who are reasonably capable of making up the pool of employed, then it means that that slackness in the labor market, that excess supply of labor in the labor market is going to be forcing real wages to fall. And over time, in the long run, real wages will fall. And those falling real wages is going to incentivize businesses to hire more workers. But it's also possible for the demand for labor to be greater than the effective labor force. If we had effective full employment and there is 
a boom in some local industry, perhaps because of export demand, then the businesses in that industry and in related industries are going to be trying to produce more than what the effective labor force can produce. We're going to have tightness in the labor market. Businesses are going to be trying to hire people who are not necessarily currently unemployed. They're going to be porting workers from other businesses in the same industry and from other industries. And at the same time, because of tightness in the labor market, businesses are going to be reluctant to lose workers. And that competition for the inadequate supply of workers is going to push rail wages up. So as much as we speak about the naturally unemployed, it's possible for the amount of employment to encroach on the naturally unemployed. And so frictional unemployment shrinks below its usual level. And it might even be the case that some of the structurally unemployed can get work out of the desperation of businesses to expand their output to meet higher demand. So we treat full employment, the economy's sort of natural capacity to produce, not as a rigid line, as a rigid limit, but as a normal level that the economy can actually produce greater than or more easily understandably, produce less than. Using the labor force in this way, we can recognize that the economy's level of output can be related to the economy's level of employment. The production function relates output to the amount of factors of production needed to produce that output. And we are here focusing on the labor market. So we can, we can recognize that the monotonic relationship, the one-to-one -one relationship between each possible level of output, you know, $10 billion of GDP and how much labor force it takes to produce it, 1 million uh, employees. Uh, and, and so it takes 2 million employees to produce $20 billion of output. Of course, it won't be a proportional relationship, but for the sake of simplicity, we just want to establish that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of the labor force that is employed and the economy's output. So full employment, in the sense in which we have described it, when the effective labor force is fully employed, translates into the full employment level of output. What is the level of output that corresponds to full employment? And we know that if output is less than the full employment level of output, we know what is happening in the labor market. If output is greater than the full employment level of output, then again, we know what is happening in the labor market. So let us look at GDP in relation to the full employment level of output. If GDP happens to be less than the full employment level of output, the economy's normal capacity level of output, then it means that there is slackness in the labor market, there is excess supply of labor, and therefore wages are going to be falling over time, over the long run. If on the other hand, 
GDP happens to be above the full employment level of output. Then we know there is excess demand for labor in relation to the economy's effective labor force, effective labor supply. And that excess demand for labor in the labor market is going to be causing real wages to rise over time. So now it means that we can look at the economy's GDP in relation to the economy's trend output, normal capacity output, full employment output, all those terms are synonymous, and to be able to anticipate whether the aggregate supply curve is going to be shifting downwards in the years to come or shifting upwards in the years to come. It's not obvious to the naked eye anyway, that the real level of wages and salaries actually responds to, you know, the, whether the economy is in a recession or a boom, as we have described, but there is a, a, a substantial amount of, of evidence from studies that this is in fact the case. Here we have an article from the, from the financial crisis of a few years ago, uh, telling us that recession prompted unprecedented fall in wages. Wages have fallen more in real terms, that is in purchasing power terms, in the current economic downturn than ever before. So now we understand that the cost of production will rise or fall depending on whether the amount of production requires more or less than the economy's normal productive capacity. <clears throat>